I'm Christina May, the online pastor at World Harvest Church in Enid, Oklahoma. You're about to hear a spirit-filled message from our pastor. So grab your Bible, and if you're a coffee lover like me, grab a cup of coffee and get ready for a personal word that God has for you today. And open up your Bible with me to the book of Romans chapter 12. As you're turning to Romans chapter 12, let me give you a real quick update right quick. Those you've been tracking with us for the last several weeks, Marquita Cisneros is home. So she is home after several weeks of being in the hospital uh, with COVID. Uh, Gloria, she is doing better. She's on a track now. She is slowly progressing. Continue to pray for her. Sammy Christian will be home this coming Friday. Sammy's coming home out of the hospital. And then Eleanor Mary, uh, she's in a facility in Perry. Uh, continue to pray for her. She's just She has some good moments and then some setback moments. So continue to pray for her and all that are dealing with COVID. All right, Romans chapter 12, we're taking another dive into the series we started out last week called Stones, Wedges, and Bridges. And I want us to jump right in here here this morning because we're we've got to understand a principle here that we are created for the herd we are created for community when Jesus was asked what's the most important thing he said listen all you got to do is two things anybody remember what those words all you got to do is just love God and love who else love people very simple right and not as simple as it sounds come on how many of y'all know the loving God's the easy part but loving the people is the challenging part and it's through this last year and a half that there's just, there's just, church, we're in a war right now. Things are not normal. We're in an all-out war. And I just am reminded of this again here this morning that, you know, I've, I keep wanting to go back to pre-COVID times, but man, it's not going to happen. It may be a while that we're in the middle of this war, that we're fighting in so many different fronts right now. And, and I believe that one of the attacks that has come against us as the body of Christ is this attack against community, attack against relationships, because there are so many people, man, they're having some issues right now. And so I believe that this is a word in season. And, and listen to me, today's message, and especially next Sunday's message, you don't want to miss out. I want to challenge you to lean into this because I believe that God is speaking something very specific today that we've got to hear. And what I'm preaching today is not that, that uh, of a popular message right now. And so I want to dive into this. I want to look here in Romans chapter 12 and just talking about, you know, the need for community. What is community? Community can be defined as simply common unity. Church, we're living in a day and age where the church as a whole, where Christian people are, mis are more disjointed than I think they've been in I don't know how long. There's more strife, there's more division, there's more hurt, there's more pain. Man, we see people getting divorced like never before. So we are in interesting times. And I want you to see something that Paul spoke as a word of encouragement to the church in Rome in Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 9. It's several verses long here. So just track with me here. In the New Living Translation, verse 9, chapter 12, Romans says this. Paul says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection. Take delight in honoring each other. Verse 11, never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Verse 12, rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on, on praying. Verse 13, when God's people are in need, I like this. Be ready to help. Always be eager. Practice hospitality. How many of you know these are some good things he's talking about here, right? Verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Verse 15, be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Verse 16, look at this. Live in harmony with each other. Church, I need to ask a question. Don't respond right now, but are we living in harmony as a whole in the United States of America no. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. Don't think, don't think you know it all, verse 17. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you are honorable. Verse 18, do all that you can to what? To live in peace, live in peace with everyone. Verse 19, dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scripture says, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Verse 20, instead, if your enemies are hungry, what does he say to do? Feed them. If you're thirsty, give them something to drink. And doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame upon their heads. Verse 21, 
Don't let evil conquer you. But conquer evil by doing good. Man, what an encouragement for us here today in the times that we're living in. Paul penned that so beautifully well. But yet when we look around in our culture and our day-to-day activities, do we see that going on today? I, I don't see a lot of it today. I, I, I don't see people talking about much. Let's get together. Let's come together in unity. I don't see people talking about love and, and, and community. I don't, I don't see that today. But you know, I just, just I talked about it last week. What I see a lot of is, is people throwing rocks like we talked about last Sunday. Come on, when we start judging people, we see that all the time, people judging each other, judging preferences, judging their likes, judging all these things. We were never meant to, to judge. Come on, look at your name and say, I'm not gonna throw rocks. But I, I, I really believe the Lord is wanting to speak something here because I can't help but think, I started in this last week, but the early church there in the book of Acts, man, it's talked about the unity that they walked in, that they come together in fellowship and I, I truly believe that there was a dynamic that was created. You know, it's like setting a thermostat. You know, in this room, I could set that thermostat to 65 degrees and y'all start shivering in a little bit, right? Or I could set it up to 80 degrees, man, y'all start sweating a little bit. Why? Because the thermostat is what sets the temperature, sets the environment. I can't help but to think, did the early church create an environment because of the unity that they walked in that caused the power of God to flow? I can't help but to think, yes, they did. Because where there is unity, man, there, God is in unity. God is in where two people come together in a marriage, where there is unity in the marriage, God's in it. In a business where there is unity, God's in it. Come on, in a church where there's unity, come on, how many of you know God's in it? And I, we are all concerned about the condition of our nation today, and it's like, man, but I can't help but to think, what have we done to God? We've taken God out of it, and we see all this disunity and discord and all the strife that's going on. I think we need to get back to what Paul spoke to us there in Romans and let's start living our life that way. We can't control the entire world, but we can control our conduct, can we not? Amen. I want to speak to you for just a few moments about this. This is just my simple title. Be aware of wedges, not wedgies. (laughs) Be aware of the wedges. Let's dive right in here because I just don't have a lot of time today. What is a wedge? Wedge. A wedge. A wedge defined is simply this. Look at this definition here. I think it's in your notes. A wedge is something that creates a division, a gap, or a distance between things. A wedge. Something that creates division. Okay? Wedges. What are wedges? Now, have you ever been around people that love to argue? <laughs> Let me ask. Anybody y'all here love to argue? Somebody going to argue the fact that I made that statement. You know what I'm saying? I just... I've got a few people in my life that love to argue. The argument is not the issue. It's do you drive a wedge? Come on. And a wedge is created when there is an, an initial disagreement. Let me just see if I can illustrate this. Everybody knows what this is here. But anytime that you have a disagreement, you know, you have that opportunity for a, a, a something, an initial blow, whether it's in a marriage relationship, whether it's in a business situation, whether it's in a church, any type of teams or a relationship, any time that there is a disagreement, you have the opportunity to work through that disagreement or there's an opportunity for the wedge to be driven in this. And then this is the way the Lord has been showing this to me because, you know, Tame and I, I was telling a couple of this yesterday, you know, we've, we've been married for 33 years, but that 33 years just didn't happen just by happenstance. It wasn't by default that we married for 33 years, you know, because there's times that, man, I tell you what, she would just drive me crazy. I'm like, man, can she not get it? Come on, I know every husband in this room, I know you, maybe you've never had that, that thought before. You know, with her, she's like, man, what is wrong with Brad? Is he just stupid or what? You know, <laughs> come on, every marriage goes through those moments. We all have the moments where we disagree, but that becomes the moment that you're going to have to either work through the disagreement or you're going to drive a wedge. What does a wedge do? A wedge creates what? Division. Division. And I tell you, we've seen a lot of this in our culture today. Now, is it wrong to disagree? No. You save that thought and that well, just went off, went off your head for next Sunday because I'm going to dive into that. Both of you, we're going to dive into that thought right there. 
about how we work through disagreements and what does it mean to disagree. The issue is, what do we do with the disagreement, okay? We all have opinions, do we not? And there's one thing I know about us Americans, we are full of opinions. Come on, we all got our preferences, we got the, come on, where's all my Ford truck lovers in the church? Come on, where's all the Chevy truck lovers in the church? Only one bold enough to say, because they know they're wrong, that's what it is. Now that's a little fun example there, but if I really seriously, if I've got a disagreement, I can choose to work through the disagreement or I can choose to what? Drive a wedge. Every time that you visit a situation that you haven't resolved the issue, you're gonna continue to drive a wedge. Church, I can't tell you how many times I saw this scenario happen over the last year and a half. People driving wedges, people driving wedges. People on two sides of the fence on issues. You know, we still got that going on today. These wedges, these things are creating division. And then we continue to hammer and hammer up on those things, driving those in. You know, a wedge is created when we have that disagreement, when a conflict happens and that there is no resolution. I want you to see something that Jesus said in Matthew chapter seven. Let's look at this right quickly. Matthew chapter seven, I'm gonna read it to you out of the passage translation here. Matthew chapter seven starts out in verse one. Jesus said this, refuse to be a critic full of bias towards others. Come on, everybody say, I refuse to be a critic. Refuse to be that critic full of bias towards others and judgment will not pass upon you. Verse two, for you'll be judged, listen to this. You're gonna be judged by that same standard that you've used to judge others. The measurement that you use on them gonna be used back on you. Verse three says, why would you focus on the flaw in someone else's life and yet fail to notice the glaring flaws in your own? Verse four, how could you say to your friend, let me show you where you're wrong when you're guilty of even more? Verse five, you're being hypocritical and a hypocrite. First acknowledge your own blind spots and deal with them and then you'll be capable of dealing with the blind spot of your friend. Church, what would the world be like if we spent more time working on ourselves and trying to correct everyone else around us? Come on, the scripture says, how can you, I don't know, I was was talking to one of the guys here this morning, saw this on, you know, he says, how can you point out the speck in your brother's eye when you've got a plank hanging out of your own eye? You know what, you're wrong. You're wrong. You know what? You believe that way. This is the way you got to believe. You know, but that is such a picture, you know, of our world today, the plank in our own eye, and we're sitting around trying to correct everybody else. Church, I talked about it last week. We are not put up on this earth to be the judge of others, to be the critic of others. Come on. We are called to do what? Anybody remember? Come on. We're called to love each other. Where is the love in our world today? Where is the love in our society? Where is the love in our city? Where is the love? To what it grieves me. I mean, many of y'all know Jonathan served as city commissioner last year. And I mean, he, you, you would be shocked at the stories that I heard of things that he had endured just because he took a side, a stance that, hey, we need to have masks because the doctors say and all this stuff. And I tell you, the mask is still a hot topic. But he was ridiculed. He was made fun of. He was criticized. And this is what just ticked me off, not by God, sinners and ungodly people by Christians, God-fearing Christians. I mean, I hate to even stir this up. We may have to pray for Jonathan after we're done here, but I mean, there was a, a, a pastor here in town that ridiculed him on Facebook and, and, and basically called him out that he was a sinner and that he's going to have to answer to God. I'm like, that is, oh, don't get me started. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Jeez, but I tell you what, I mean, whether you're a masker or an unmasker, whether you're pro-vaccine or anti-vaccine, let me tell you, we have the opportunity to continue to drive wedges into situations. We can drive our viewpoint and we can criticize everybody else around us, or we can choose to build bridges, to build bridges. And I dare to say there's not a lot of bridge builders going on in our culture right now. Come on, look at your name and tell them you got to build a bridge. 
Because before I get to that point there, just think about this for just a second. What are some of the effects of a wedge? A wedge that continues to be driven on is eventually gonna bring division. If I would continue to hammer on that wedge, what would happen to this log? It would split apart. And I tell you, there's been a lot of division happening. You know, there's a lot of hurt feelings. There are many people, I'm convinced of this, that are living their life with a wedge inside of them. And every guy knows, you know, what happens when you work with wood and you get a splinter? It hurts, does it not? I, I'm kind of one of those worst ones. Just the other day, I was doing something, I got a splinter, man. And I'm like, man, I just I didn't want to use my hand. I, I thought I pulled it out, but there was a little bit in it. And for days and days and days, that remained sensitive. Church, there are many of y'all that listen to me right now. You've got a wedge inside of you. Something has happened, a disagreement has happened, a fight has happened. Some of y'all have had people in your past hurt you. But the news is, the good news is that God's grace is sufficient. Come on, how many of y'all thank God for his grace and for his mercy in our lives? <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, I like what it says here in verse 14 and 15. It says this, work and living in peace with everyone. Work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look after each other, verse 15 says, so that none of, your fa- no, so none of you fails to receive God's, the grace of God. Listen, look at this. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. See, if we don't take care of the wedge, that wedge will remain lodged there just like a splinter in your finger and it will affect you. If you don't take care of hurt, if you don't take care of pain, if you don't take care of offense properly, it will turn to bitterness. And a bitter root produces bitter fruit. A wedge not taken care of is like putting on a pair of glasses that now distorts the entire perspective with which you look through. And if you don't take care of the wedge, if you don't take care of the hurts, you don't take care of the pain, let me tell you, it will affect everything in your life. How many times, you know, have we, um, Tame and I, I was just thinking about this, I talked to somebody and we start talking about surface issues, especially when it comes to marriage. Well, she does this and he does that and pointing fingers at each other. When the reality is, if you can peel back the layers, most likely there is a root issue that's causing the actions. Bitter roots produce bitter fruits. So when it comes to relationships, anytime you see something, an action taking place that, you know, that's, that's off. There's a root that is causing that action. Husbands and wives, let me speak to you for just a moment. If you are having a repetitive issue in your marriage, there is a root that's causing that. You need to figure out what that is. And so when it comes to relationships, we can, we can choose to carry grudges. We can choose to carry offenses against someone or, or, or you know, we can choose to build a bridge in their lives. We can choose to work past those things. When we carry offense against somebody, it's like us drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. So how do we get rid of the wedge? Look at your neighbor and tell me you got to get rid of the wedge. Let me, let me just nail down on this here for just a few moments. We got to get rid of the wedge. The reason why I'm bringing this message today is because I see way too many wedges right now happening in good Christian people. I got to share this story. I just got to give some praise here for a, a couple in our church. As a few weeks ago, I made a comment up here on the stage that I knew created some tension uh, it was some preference related to some personal preferences uh, and it was related relationship to the vaccine. And I didn't realize that I had said the way I said it would kind of created some, uh, a little bit of a discussion. And so when word got back to me that, hey, man, I, you may need to address this a little further, I, I was a little concerned because I felt like a wedge had been, that I had inserted a wedge into the relationship. But I tell you what, I, I, I just got to share this as a testimony because I went to this couple the next Sunday and before I could say anything, they grabbed me and said, Pastor, we love you so much. And it wasn't, oh, I love you. It was sincere from their heart. And I like, yes, I don't know if you've ever been to that moment, but it just so blessed me for that to realize that what could have been a potential wedge driven to relationship, even though there might've been some varying, just slight different preferences of what we believe, they chose to look past that which could have been an offense and could have been a hurt, could have been a discussion. They said, we love you. 
And I tell you what, I was like, man, that blessed me. I'm like, where is that in our society? Why can't more people be like that today? Still, we, the wedges get driven and just they, we drive them deeper and deeper and the hurt gets hurt more, more and more and more. I mean, husbands and wives, listen, you, we are in a season that what can be shaken will be shaken. And if your marriage, if there's a crack in it, a wedge can easily be driven into that thing. And you know what? The enemy loves nothing more than to do than just to keep pounding on that thing time and time again. Time and time again, whatever it may be. So you should sit up here to close. It's more closer to the front. It's more exciting up here to the front. <laughs> Ephesians chapter four, look at this real quickly here. Ephesians chapter four, verse 31 says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Verse 32, instead, what does he say? Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Jesus Christ has forgiven you. Gotta get rid of it. Church is dangerous to walk around with the wedges in our life. It's dangerous to carry that stuff in our life. How do we do this? Let me tell you, we gotta be quick to forgive. We gotta be quick for that. And again, I'm gonna dive into this more next week, but what, look what Jesus said. Look, look with me in Mark chapter 11, what Jesus said here. I wanna read it to you out of the passage translation because I truly do believe that there are many that are hearing my voice right now. You're dealing with some stuff in your life. Even as I've talked for just these brief few moments, you've identified there's some wedges that's been put inside of me. But I believe that here today by the power of the Holy Spirit that God's gonna remove some wedges today, amen? Come on, we need some spiritual wedgies. You know, wedgies, you know, anyway, that... Forget that, that joke didn't fly very good. So scratch that. But anyway, I want you to see something here in Mark chapter 11, starting verse 25. Jesus has been talking about having the God kind of faith. Come on, where's my faith people here today? Come on, where's everybody that's strong in faith today? Let me hear you today. Come on, we love walking in faith and believing God here, don't we? But in verse 25, after the great faith scripture, it says this, Mark 11, it says, and whenever you stand praying, he says, if you find that you carry what? Something in your heart against any another person. Something in your heart against another person. I wonder how many people that are hearing my voice right now are carrying something against somebody else today. Let me tell you, I've had to work through this myself. Find that you carry something in your heart against another person. What does he say to do? Come on, everybody say it with me. Release him. Come on, are you reading that along with me? Release him and what? Forgive Forgive him so that your Father in heaven will, be, will also release you and forgive you of your faults. Verse 26, if you will not release forgiveness, don't expect your Father in heaven to release you from your misdeeds. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that Jesus Christ paid the price for my sins. And God no longer holds my faults against me. But right here in this passage of scripture, we see just this point being driven home that if we don't forgive others and release them, then God can't release us. It's almost like he's saying here that me being released from my past is totally dependent upon me being able to release other people that's hurt me. To be honest with you, I don't like that. I've got people in my life that have hurt me. I've been through bad business deals with family. I've been through, you know, a lot of church hurt. You know, I've been pastoring this church for a lot of years. I've had people, you know, come in and sing praises in one moment, say, man, God called me here. And the next moment they're out talking bad about us and pulling people away. I mean, it's the life of a pastor is kind of crazy. But I've had to get to this point that I've had to learn to release people. Because when the wedges are driven into my heart, I tell you, it hurts. It sucks. Come on, I think I'm speaking to everybody here today. We've all had that wedge driven into us. It's not fun. I've had moments in my life, I've, you know, people come to my mind when I think of this, and I've, I've had those moments where I've been hurt. And I've had those moments where I'm like, God, I'm waiting for them to come back and beg for my forgiveness. You know, God, if you would just cause them, you know, to calm and just ask for my forgiveness and and, and just admit how bad they treated me and all that, I thought, you know, that'd be pretty cool. (laughs) Anybody else with me? But you know what I've learned? Very rarely does that ever happen. Very rarely does anybody ever admit that they made the mistake. This is what I know. It takes a bigger person 
to be able to release and forgive even when somebody's not asking for it. That's spiritual maturity. I've had to do that time and time again. But you know what I've learned about forgiveness and releasing people? To forgive is an act, but forgiveness is a journey. To forgive is an act, forgiveness is the journey that we walk on. The people in my life that I've been hurt by, the wedge has been driven into me. I've had to have a moment with God. God, I release them, I forgive them. But you know what I've learned? The thoughts keep coming back. But just like my salvation, when the enemy ever questions me about, am I really truly saved? I have a moment in my life where I was, gave my heart to the Lord as a young child. I really don't remember, but I do remember getting baptized. I do remember that moment. That's the point in my life that I remember my salvation. Same way when it comes to forgiveness. I've had those moments in my life where I've had to forgive somebody. And every time those thoughts come back to me, well, you poor thing, can't believe you've done that way. I can say, you know what? No, I forgave them. And I refuse to let self-pity into my life. Self-pity loves to find those that have a crack in their heart that come dwell in them. Self-pity makes things that really bad. Self-pity, listen, leads to bitterness. Bitter roots produce bitter fruits in our lives. To forgive is an act. Forgiveness is the journey in that. <laughs> Let me just tell you something. Just, I'm not going to be long, but something really stupid I did. Anybody ever do anything stupid? Come on, where's my fellow stupiders? <laughs> in fourth grade, I was fourth grade. My brother, I've got an older brother who's uh, three and a half years older than me. And uh, in fourth grade, we was living in a house in Guyman, Oklahoma. It's actually 123 Paul Avenue for those little Guymanites. And uh, I don't know how it happened. We had somehow had a 16 pound bowling ball in the house. And so um, the house was living in had a garage that had been remodeled to a living room and they just put carpet down with no padding below that thing. So me and my brother being boys, we had this brilliant idea of playing catch with a 16 pound bowling ball. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant idea. Try it parents at home. No, don't do that. <laughs> so I remember kind of throwing the ball over to my brother and I'm four, out of fourth grade. I don't remember how old that would have been, but he throws it to me, he throws me a big old lobber, 16 pound bowling ball, catch that thing and just goes to the floor quickly and just smashed my little finger plumb open. I just, looked at the thing, it was just totally open flesh. You know, first thing I remember seeing the fat globules and I'm like, ooh, that's kind of cool. But it was like, then I was free, started freaking out. Split that sucker just from top to bottom wide open. And uh, of course, went and got the stitches and all that stuff. You know, for a long time, that thing hurt. It festered, it hurt, it was painful. But you know, there was a time that it finally healed up. You know what, even today, I got this very ugly scar here on my little finger. It's kind of cool because even the way it healed, you know how you got the swirlies at the end of your centers of your finger to prints? I got two of them on my finger the way it healed. But you know, I've got the scar of this wound, but it's not sensitive at all. It's not painful at all. It's just kind of, I remember the stupidity as being a little kid. I just want to speak this. This is a word for somebody. You've been hurt bad. A wedge was driven into your relationship and it hurt bad and you're still hurting right now. Maybe it's a former spouse, I don't know. Maybe a boss, maybe a former pastor, a former friend, and it hurts. I'm sorry for that. But I believe as you turn it over to God and you release and forgive, that there'll be a point in your life that just like the scar on my finger, you'll see it and you'll remember it, but it'll be just kind of like something in your past, like a, you're reading a history book, the pain is no longer there. That's the beauty of God's grace and his healing power upon us. Thanks again for listening. We hope that this message inspires, challenges, and fuels you up to take a real Jesus to a real world. If you'd like to connect with us in any way, please go to harvestenid.com slash connect. Or if you'd like to learn more about us as a church, please go and check us out at harvestenid.com. We can't wait to share another message with you next week. 